in your heart and mind, we can grasp this thought. We have to understand why did the Lord say such a thing. It's very important for you and I to grab that thought. Why would he say something is clean and something is unclean? Is this something new that he taught? Absolutely not. This is all the way back to the Old Testament. We're going to go, if you will, turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 10. And we'll look at verse 11. Be you separate from the unclean thing. How is that done see we talk about these things and i say we all of us we talk about this but if you don't know how to do that you may already have your hands on the unclean thing and you may be the unclean thing that was a statement made uh in the scriptures that says that is an abomination that makes desolate that is a thing that you can accomplish in your life that you will make everything else a rejected item in the eyesight of God and you know there's a lot of debate on certain sins that people don't feel make that happen but you know let me tell you something one of the things I found out and it is amazing what I thought what you think and what we think together, it means absolutely zero to the Lord. You know, I found that out both the hard way and through wisdom. It means nothing to him. And not that he's brash and evil and mean. He doesn't care what we think. It's just he has the plan. He controls all things. There is no fear in God's heart as to any leader that is in control. God allowed his people to be among an Egyptian ruler who hated his guts. And worshipped regularly a fake wood, stone, and marble, any other kind of God he could design. And he was ruthless, a murderer. But nevertheless, one of the worst kings ever in existence is Rome. The way they were bloodthirsty and murdered. God had no fear his people were among them. He had no fear. Because he is in control of everything. There has no feel like God saying, Oh, what shall we do with this beast? No. See, and when you think that way that's what makes you fear when you understand who god is and how in control he is that means he's in control of you and me and that means he's in control of our salvation and you don't get to talk to each other we don't get to commune with each other come up with some heroic plan on how to save souls it's already been said the problem is we don't like that because it involves how we have to live after salvation don't you ever think people don't know what they're doing when you tell them they need to get baptized. They know. See, we know that we got to give up something. See, you, you can't possibly teach that in-depth thought. That has to be within us. As we process information, it is revealed by God in us. This is truth. So when someone tells you they don't understand, they're telling you don't believe. Once you've broken it down to them. John 3 gives us validation. They're telling you, I don't believe that. I refuse to accept that. Someone else told me different, and I'm going to believe that. Never worry about knowing someone to tell them the truth. Never worry about what their religious belief is to tell the truth. The same truth was carried from people who spoke different languages to people that they had never saw in their lives. Never saw in their lives. Not even known of the nation. God said, I'm going to bring an ancient nation to destroy you. He said, they're ancient, but you don't know anything about them, Jerusalem. He says, and they don't like old people. They don't respect gray hair. He says, you've been taught different when they come to your land. He says, you can't even talk their language. You know nothing of their culture. And he says, I'm going to have them beat you to death for disrespecting me. You might say, well, why would he be so angry? See, every breath you took since now, then to now, God gave you that breath. Even if you hate his guts, because there's many people listening to this message. God gave you every breath, every heartbeat, every blood flow. He prevented any cancer or any strokes or anything from happening to you right now until you can hear this message and many others that you've already heard. He is in full control of your existence and all he has to do is say that's it and you're gone. It has nothing to do with his past, he's given you and me a chance. That's something you have to accept. You are not in control of anything except to obey or disobey God. That's you. you have 100% control of obedience to God. It is 
your decision. And you have 100% control of disobedience. God. It has nothing to do with what you've been taught or who taught you. It has to do with when you hear truth, now you have control. And God is in control of that rule. Because if he wasn't, they would have gotten rid of all the Bibles so long ago. The Bibles would be so destroyed because man has destroyed many things that God did not want him to destroy. But he can't touch the Bible. You ever wonder why? It's not because there's too many believers. It's because God says, I'm going to keep this book intact. It will stay perfectly intact. So when you hear people discredited because they don't believe it, saying, oh, that's misquoted, written by man, that's okay. Stand down, let the glory of God be shown. Ezra 10 and 11. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers. And do his pleasure. And separate yourselves from the people of the land. And from the strange wife. Israel had gotten themselves into a land because of their lifestyle. That caused them to intermingle with other nations. It had nothing to do with the texture of their hair or the color of their skin. It had to do with the worship practice that they had. How do we know that? Because Moses' wife is black at the time and she does not look like other Israelites. So that kills that lie that has been taught. Okay? So that's where we're at. So it has nothing to do. God has never been a racist. He has never, ever taught racism. Never. What he has taught is a separation from those who worship contrary to him. And he's still teaching that today. That's why many of us are in trouble in life. Because we have adjoined ourselves to those who worship contrary to God. And he will not accept us. The food we have, the things we possess, everybody gets to eat. Do you know that mass murderers eat three squares a day? Do you know that? Yes. In jail. And if they aren't fed that, and a lot of exercise, add to breed. They come down hard on the wall and he loses his cushion job. To make sure that's done. Who do you think's feeding him? Man? If man had his choice, he wouldn't feed none of us. God. God said, I feed the lion. Say, well, you feed the whelps when they cry in the night. He said, do you hear their voice when they die? Those baby lions die. He said, do you hear it? He said, could you do something about it? You can't do anything. God is in control. And when God says, separate yourself from the unclean thing, don't expect anything physical to happen, but expect much to happen spiritually to judge. Much. Because he always keeps his word. He is God. And when you have a respect for God, no, he is. You know, you don't know what you'll have to give up to serve the most high God. Amen. See, and, and most of it will cost us a thing we desire greatly. But that'll be the thing preventing us from being spiritual and helping others to follow. You have to understand it. The problem is when you hear it, it hurts because it's a whipping. No discipline feels good at any time, but it brings forth fruit of peaceableness. But at the time it's administered, you can expect to hear, ouch, ooh, why don't you love me anymore? Because the Lord said in Hebrews 12, it will never feel good. So when we get the information that crushes us, and our dreams go like dandelion flying through there. Recognize you have a choice at this point. Shall I stand with God or shall I leave? Because if you say, well, I'll come back later, you don't have that choice. Mm -hmm. See, you don't get to tell God like a vending machine, I don't want peanuts this time, I'll come back later. Put a couple more quads and I'll get peanuts. No. Nah. See, because he doesn't work like that. He does not. And so now let's look at some more of the thought. So we understand separation has always been a part of what God has taught. One of three errors. Teaching the doctrine of Jesus. You must separate yourself from errors in that. In worshiping God collectively, you must separate yourself in errors in that. In daily living. How do you touch this unclean thing? How is that even displayed? And so what does it mean? Don't touch the unclean thing. How do I touch? There's two ways. You touch it in actions or either the way you think. Amen. It's the way. See, you can touch it either way. You can just not say something to people who walk contrary mm -hmm. and not bother about it. And you've touched it. Or you can participate in it. And you've touched it. You can like secretly what they're doing. Oh, I like the way they dance nasty. 
naughty girl, naughty boy, but I'm not going to do it. You can like it, and you still touched it. Amen. How do we know that? Go to Romans chapter 1. We're already in trouble. The Lord said in Matthew 5, if you think on your neighbor's spouse to be with them. He said, you're already in a dub. You don't have to commit. He said, I'm going to judge the heart. Why? Because Romans chapter 1 explains why. Look at, if you will, uh, verse. You know, some people like these things. And we're going to talk more about it tonight, too. Uh, we have part two of the message is heterosexual lifestyle of culture. Or is it of creation? See, the homosexual world has told you, y'all only been doing that because it was a culture. Much like women can't do anything and men are in control. See, that's their ignorant analogy. That's not God's analogy. God set the order from the beginning of how you should conduct yourself. But some people think it's cute. And I want to give you something clear. A lot of women can akin to homosexual men. Listen to me. A lot of women. They share ideas on clothes and jewelry and stuff. They think it's so, oh, he's my friend. He's been there for me. Okay, you know, that's a lot of people can be there for you. And cut your throat later. You know why? Because the Lord said, don't eat the dainty meats with them. Because they have an evil eye. That's any individual. And he said, and he says it's with you, but his heart is not. He says, you choke on the morsel that you're eating. What? What he's feeding your spirit is going to choke you. Just like if you choke on a piece of meat. And you're going to lose the spiritual power you had over your life you're gonna die right there but you'll live physically and maybe even prosper more than you've ever prospered but nevertheless Romans chapter 1 what did the Lord say about this lifestyle and all sins look at if you will in verse 23 and change the glory see that's a glory of God of uncorruptible you can't adjust it and make it nasty into an image made like to corrupt of a man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore well, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. This is there. So he gives them up. He tries for the soul. Then he says, okay, well, I'm going to let you go. This is what you want to do. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So a lot of people don't like to talk about this. See, this type of a message can cost you members. That's why you don't hear it a lot. Even in the church of Christ. Ask yourself, when the last time you heard, if you visit our church, Christ, ask yourself, anywhere you visit, the last time you heard a message against homosexuality, I mean a detailed message on it. Not just singing, passing. Because I know I have a lot of members in there, man, I'm going to run them off. I need my nice car at home. Well, you know, you can always get a job. I met a 72-year-old man who worked seven days a week. Seven days a week, eight hours a day. You believe that? And still went to church and preach. Brother Paul Melchizedek, can you believe that? So why, why don't other preachers not be able to do some work? I'm not saying that that is the life you desire because it takes away from what you would like to do. But what I'm saying is if you're going to adjust your preaching to keep members to keep money in your pocket, that's ridiculous. Amen. You're killing your soul and theirs because you're not telling the truth. It says uh, that who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature, which is that which is created, more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affection. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Do you notice what he says? Listen to what he says. Listen to the law speak. Even their women. Why would he say even their women? Because see, men lead in sin. Listen to me. See, as a male, you're a leader. And God has a scope on you. If you're shiftless and worthless, he's got a prize for you at the end. It's called a reward, but it's a bad one. As I says, even the women. Why? Because men lead. That's what we're made for. But we're supposed to be leading in righteousness. Adam is first. See, you think that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because God says what I made is good. He was supposed to lead in right, And then he backed up. And followed in error. Why? Because his wife was so mean? No, because he was so weak. He thought if I lose all, I've lost all. Let me share something with you. If you want to be a real man, be a Christian man. And make the decisions of a Christian. Amen. Which means it may cause a lot of drama. But do you understand everyone's going to die or be changed? 
either be changed into something to last forever of strength and power or something to last forever of weakness and torment. Some people say, well, I want a good man. Do you really? That means you're going to have to go to church. Oh, oh, you really want a good man? Wow. Oh, my. No more all-day visits to the beach because we go to church on Sunday now. Good man doesn't look too good anymore, does it? A strong man. Like strong black coffee. You know how tough black coffee is to drink if you don't know what you're doing? No sweetness, no milk. Yeah, it's got its own natural sweetness. But you may not like that. So when you try to add sugar or cream to the strong man, you weaken him. You dilute his strength. Yeah. So maybe you want a weak man and just don't want to acknowledge it. One that you can control and run and rule. But that wouldn't be good for you. Because at the end, he'll cost you a soul. May look good, but is he good? See, that's the difference. That's the problem that we face in society. But this card says God gives them up to vile affection. Even the women did change. What does nature mean? Natural. It's nature. It's what she was taught to do. It's what she's made to do. Not taught by man. Watch it. See, here's the thing. This is the big argument. What makes it unclean. The big argument is, it is a cultural lifestyle to be a heterosexual. No, it's not. It is a God-given ability. See, God gives you ability. But if you don't like it, he'll turn you over to whatever your heart wants. So that the judgment, you can't say that he forced you. See, he's not going to be in the debate and lose an argument. God said, I gave you what you asked for. What your heart wanted from me. So he says, and likewise also the men. Leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense for the error that was which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their Nazi death, notice the problem. I don't glorify him as God. I don't want to retain. I don't glorify him as God. I glorify him as my physical daddy, which means he's prone to error. No. And I won't retain the knowledge that he gave me. I'll spit some of it out. He says, God gave them over to reprobate mind, which means it is rejected. The mind is rejected. To do things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Now listen. See, now here comes the other. See, the world, when they teach this, they teach it wrong. They're trying to teach you that homosexuality spawns other sins. That is a lie. That's one of the sins he does. He explains how homosexuality comes about. How can someone go so grotesquely against nature? So because same way they do the other sin. They don't glorify me as God. And in addition, they won't retain my knowledge. A homosexual is not a beast. It's not a monster. It's just a human being going astray. But they will do a ankle break move on you, so to speak, like in basketball, making you think that there's something wrong with you. Or that you're afraid of them. Listen, let me share something with you. No one in God's kingdom is afraid of becoming a homosexual. Just being around a homosexual. That's ridiculous. See, that's their teaching. They have dissension within their own ranks. And the dissension is some say we're born that way. Some say we choose. The ones say we're born that way is saying that so that they can be able to say I can't change. The other one says we choose so we can get the glory that I made the choice. It's a better lifestyle than you guys got. <laughs> Using the argument of having babies, that makes no sense. That is not the reason why God is against homosexuality. That has nothing to do with having babies. Because everyone's not going to be a homosexual. The argument it is, is a sin. And now look at the other things. All unrighteousness. Anything unrighteous. Fornication. That's in now. That's different individuals of different genders male and female having sex and not being married or having sex and not married to that person wickedness covetousness just simply being greedy malicious talking about people with no valid proof full of envy envious jealous murder debate want to argue and not listen to what god has said deceit malignity whisperers backbiters haters of god you know not other people that hate god haters of god despiteful proud Boasters. See, this is a whole list of things. This has nothing to do with homosexuality. In the inventors of evil things makes evil things, vile things, disobedient to parents. Let me share something with you. Because we need to understand. I'm going to use tact 
to make sure I teach right. Do you know that if you create a tool that brings pleasure, that replaces the opposite gender, you know you're an inventor of an evil thing. You got that? If you buy, you're an inventor of an evil thing. You understand that? So how can you speak that? Are you qualified? Yes, because I'm a child of God. And this is an evil thing because God made the opposite to please you. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 7, don't cheat them, don't defraud them of that. So that's a sin. So you probably know plenty of saints. I know, I know saints that have written books that have propagated to get this kind of thing going. But see, that's why hell gets bigger. Got to make room for people like her. Amen. Is that the truth? Do I want that? No. Is it a fact? Yes. Just because I don't want something, I'll make it not a fact. He says here, disobedient to parents. See, I think a lot of times children don't understand and older people don't understand because you get old. You don't have any right to look in your parents' face and tell them, you know, hey, you know, uh, I respect you, but you know, this is my life. This is my life. I make these decisions. This is my money, my house, my car. Keep saying my, and they'll be telling you my hospital bed and my dead bed coming around the corner and all say amen. Yeah. Because y'all watch your mouth. But as a younger person, a lot of children don't think that they can go to hell because they're young. But you have to let your children know there's a place for a child like you. It's hotter than anything you've ever felt because you're disrespectful. No, you don't have a right to debate. You have a right to question, ask in an appropriate time. When you're told this is not time, discuss it. Keep your mouth quiet and you may get to live a little longer than you should have been alive. Because the law says there's a blessing for you, an extension of life with good days. With good days. See, some people have honored their parents so they get the long life and good days, but they end up in hell because they dishonored God. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. So you see somebody always pulls soul. That pulls soul is going down because of a hatred for God. But they honored their parents. As one guy received an award, he said, I'm going to give glory to my God, my father, and my mother. Did you believe he said that? I'm not going to tell you it is. It's going to make you more heartfelt. It'll be more sad. It'll be more sad than, than it is in life. So we move forward. Listen, he says, without understanding, covenant breakers. You know one of the problems with a divorce, but you don't understand? And I'm not one that advocates that some situations do not require divorce. I understand that. I'm not angry. But you know what's wrong with a divorce? Is that you break the covenant. Amen. See that's what the Lord said in Malachi. Covenant. You broke the covenant of the wife of your youth. Break it. Some people's bodies look better than other age. You get excited. And you get your fast car and a fast girl. And you're on a fast track to hell. To break the covenant. Say so why do you always say men? Because most of the time men do it. Because men have a little edge. They got, no matter what women do, men are going to always have an edge in getting their hands on fun because you have an evil society. That's why. And that's why you see more men creeping out. They have hidden dollars and different things in their life. But God has a wide eye to see all things. And he knows how to judge. You have to understand that. And so it says, without natural effect. And see, you have been created to have an affection in you that is natural as breathing air. To reach and help someone. To love someone. To lift up people. To encourage and not discourage. It's natural. But we go against it. Ecclesiastes 7.29. The Bible says, God has man, made man upright. Solomon wrote. But he seeks out inventions so he can carry out sin. So see, this is one of them. The individual decides I'm not going to show a natural affection. Implacable, unmerciful. Watch this. We said if you just think like this, you're in trouble. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. So Brother Frias taught us a lot about this. Uh, on the air and here. They're worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So it's, look how you think. See, you don't do the same, but you like that. You like that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. You see what he did? Well, you see what he said? Cursing jokes. You know, foolish jesting. You know, you can tell a joke and it can be clean without cursing. Amen. There's a lot of jokes told. 
preachers tell jokes on time when they're preaching. I mean, I don't do that. But I mean, that's their thing. But it's not dirty. No curse words are used. So, I mean, it's no big deal. But why did it? Because the guys would tell you and the ladies, we get more laughs when we curse. So you understand? That's damnation, right? Because there's a spirit that's in you or near you encouraging you to do such a thing. It doesn't come from God. This wisdom comes not from God. James said this wisdom comes not from God. So let's go back and look at a couple more things here in the thought that we're teaching. In the doctrine. Listen, some may ask, how do we separate children from sin? What do you do with these little rascals? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Children are not beasts. They need guidance. But at the same time, while you're guiding them, make sure that when you tell them go left, that you don't go right. What do you mean? If you tell them don't be a drunkard, make sure you're not one. If you tell them don't lie, make sure you're not one. If you tell them that they may have to give up things in life, that, you know, baby, you can't do everything with your friend. Make sure you're not doing everything with your friends. Now, here we go. See, this is where the light shines. You may not understand that you already are. Listen, Paul makes some bold statements, and we're going to go there to show you how deep Christianity runs. We're going to start right here, 1 Corinthians 7 and 12. But to the rest be God, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believe it not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put away. What does please mean? I'm in agreement. Look the word up. I'm in agreement with you. See, one of the things you have to understand is when you're a Christian, when you get married, you must understand to make sure the opposite spouse knows our children are going to the Lord's church. And that's going to be a battle till somebody goes to the grave or till they get out the house. You have to be up for that battle because it's going to come. So to be careful. So, you know, you can literally marry who you want. That's the opposite gender. You can marry who you want. Say, well, we know who Moses married. Okay, well, that's great. No problem. Solomon had many strange wives, and they almost took him down. But you have to understand, are you going to fight like Solomon to get out of that? Are you going to fight like Moses? You know Moses' wife was not used to circumcision, and she debated him and debated him. And he was afraid of her. Oh, yeah. He was so afraid he wouldn't do it. Go back and read the story. She takes the knife and does it herself. I do it myself. Move. Cuts it. And throws a skin at him. You're a bloody man to me. You'll always be a bloody man to me. And if she hadn't cut that skin, God said I was going to kill him. Not her. Did you hear that? I'm going to kill you. That's what it's Go back and read it. I'm going to kill you because you are the head of the house. I'm going to kill you for not circumcising the baby killing you and he was so distraught afterwards he went to the wilderness and God told Aaron go get to see your brother he'll be glad to see you. lifts up Moses because he's down God's mad at me she's mad at me why am I doing this you have to ask yourself what are you doing why are you doing it ask yourself make sure you're doing the right thing because God is not in games with us He's not praying. He's serious. If he says something, we have to do it. So, look what he says. He says this clearly. That verse 13, And a woman which hath the husband, that believe it not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, that I not leave him. So, that's, they have to understand the thought and the process and comprehend. You know, every time you sit down to eat, do you understand that we have to pray with the Spirit? And without saying, you know what with the Spirit means? And understand, with the Spirit, he has to be in you to be with you. How's your husband going to lead the prayer at the dinner table? You know, you got to pray. What are you going to tell your children? It's okay. Daddy led the prayer and he was a Baptist preacher. Mama? Yeah, mama. What now? So you have to understand, you have to have a, a comprehension that no, These things have to be discussed. See, he may look good, she may look good, but are they good? See, because that's going to be your life. You just can't jump up and get a divorce because God hates the breaking of the covenant. So what are you going to get a divorce for? He's not beating you. He's not running around women. He's honorable. Goes to work. What are you going to get a divorce for? Yeah, but you're miserable. You have to understand, this is why these things are set in their back. Make the good decision. Be up for the battle because it's going to be yours. And the Lord will help you through 
but you have to be up for the battle. And one way of doing it is make sure you come to church so you can be fortified. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. That's where your children are unclean, but now they're holy. How's everybody cleaning house? Because you tell them, don't touch the unclean thing. You got a wife, and she may like to smoke weed a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a nation that worships God and smokes weed. The Rastafarian. They don't deny it. They applaud it. Yeah. So the idea is that, so what are you going to do? You know, she gets a little rowdy after the weed smoking. Well, they're not. You know, I, say, you know, I don't want that in my house. You know, I don't want that in my house. You know, what are you gonna do now? She said, if I can have my weed, I'm out. Well, then it's time to say, okay, you know, the door does swing out. Just close it when you leave. You say, oh, who would say that, Jose? I thought you said don't break the covenant. But let's just keep reading. We're gonna, is God gonna tell you when you can break? See, one of the things you and I don't understand is God is more serious about your soul than your physical pleasures on the earth. Your goals and dreams, your visions of grandeur and mind. He's more concerned about when you come before me, you're going to be begging me to save you, and I can't. If you haven't made a commitment to me to simply serve me, my way is better, my yoke is lighter. So it says here, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not on the bondage in such cases, but God calls the people. That is. I said, What do you do with that answer? Take it out the Bible? The children are into things. They say, okay, you know, the children are into things. And, and, and uh, the little fellow, he wants to be involved with a new martial art, but it involves a understanding of Zen Buddhism. And he's got a lot of books. You can say, hey, look at the book. He said, hey, man, this thing talking about false gods. So you're not going to be able to be involved with that. You know, this, year, this is my baby. I carry him in my stomach nine months. I'm going to be carrying him for 29 months. His soul is under my care. That's what the Christians say, brother, man or woman, no matter. And we're going to do this. See, are you ready for that battle? Are you ready? You're going to have to fight. You can't lay the sword down. What can I do, Lord? He's a man. I'm the woman. You said to obey her. Not in all things that deal with the soul. He said, obey in all things. Now, when you deal with the soul, it is painfully obvious. Abigail taught us, I'm not going to listen to my husband. I'm going to go give David the money because he's the real king and God will bless us. And guess how many days it took before God killed the husband? Ten. Two high fives. Ten. Ten days. God took his life. He treated her bad instead of telling her, you know, I think he did right. Killed him. You didn't know God had not retired from the killing business? He killed two saints for lying in Acts chapter 5. New Testament Christians for just lying together. Even though they gave money, they lied together. So you have to understand, you cannot get the glory of God and say you're right with God, we love God, we're going to do this thing, and then lie, and then not do the thing. Amen. We have to understand this is important. This is how you touch the unclean thing. And one may say, well, you know, we have to stay together to save each other's soul. God has information on that. Verse 16, for what knowest thou of wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? How do you know you're going to save your husband? God's the Savior. I don't know if thou, oh man, but thou shalt save thy wife. He says, but as God distributed to every man, as the Lord had called everyone, so let him walk, so ordained I in all the church. That means there should be no churches teaching anything different. <laughs> I mean, it's readable. It's readable information. Listen, when we teach the word of God, we have to understand the reason we don't tithe and do such things is because there has been a change of the priesthood so there's a change of the law. Why don't we worship on Saturday? Because there's been a change of the priesthood and a change of the law. So don't touch the unclean thing. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 12. What does the Bible say? Very easily. For the priesthood being changed has made a necessity a change also of the law. So what was involved in the law? Bringing animals? I don't see anybody trying to knock down doors and bring animals. Nobody's doing that. You know, it's not because of a fear of the humane society. They understand that, but they're picking and choosing. They think there's a glory in tithing. So they want to be like the Jews, but the idea is even the tithing did not save the soul. It was just part of the practice of the worship. Obedience is what saved the soul. Amen. So the priesthood has changed. There's no more Aaron priesthood. So how could you possibly give like that? Why would you worship on Saturday when Aaron taught Saturday the day of worship and his son? Christ is not of the tribe of Levi. They sprang out of Judah. They had no right to serve at the altar. 
So therefore, there is no need to do those things. And if one does it, he's trying to be justified by the law, which means you've fallen from grace, Galatians 5, and Christ's death is of none effect to you. That means your sins are still with you, even if you've been baptized into the church. That's not touching the unclean thing. That teaching is unclean, so we cannot abide by it. Here's another thought that we mentioned that we would have to deal with, and that is the understanding of why do we not use instruments? There's a simple reason. Acts chapter 17. There's a simple reason. Someone said the Bible says we doesn't say we cannot. Oh, yeah, it says you cannot. Yes, it does. It says you cannot. And I'm going to read it. Now, whether you believe it or not, or whether I believe it is irrelevant, we're going to read it. Acts 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything. Now, since... since one of Cain's sons made the instrument. That means man made the instrument. So therefore, you cannot worship God with the instrument. So whether you go buy one or you made it yourself, you cannot worship God with the instrument. Because it's made with your hands. And that would mean he needed you. You say, well, God, what for my trumpet? <laughs> How'd you hear these beautiful songs? Well, I don't need that. So Ephesians 5.19 tells us to sing unto God. You know how women teach in the church, in worship? They admonish and teach when we sing. Yeah, let's read it. Some people say, you know, but sometimes that isn't good enough. So sometimes a woman may want to be a preacher, but she will kill herself, which is not wise to do. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Look what it says. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, a spiritual song. Sing and make a melody in your heart to the Lord. That's where it's at. So that's how the woman teaches. In the worship, the words are heard from a voice. The men are listening and they're singing and we're back and forth to each other. And that's how she is alive. Somebody says, you know, do your women teach in church? Yeah, at the appropriate time and in the appropriate fashion, but not as a leader leading the whole congregation. Amen. That, that's so simple. It doesn't take anything away unless you let the devil trick you and take false glory or a false worship. Here's another thought. Understand this as we continue to look through the word of God. Jude said something about separate. Look at Jude, verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. I'm going to show you what God thinks about people that do these things. Jude 1 and 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. They speak evil of that. But what they know naturally as brute beasts. See, now look, now, now, now look how Jude addresses the heart of a man or woman that's not right with God. This is a brute beast. You know, a brute beast is very vicious. There's nothing you can do with it. It's just wild, cantankerous. Move the neck to the left or the right and damage is done to some man's flesh. It says, in those things, they corrupt themselves. Ha. Huh. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. We think so bad of Cain, but he says this is the way of Cain. And ran greedily out the heir of Balaam. We think so bad of Balaam. How could he turn down the blessings from God to receive money of men? Because we do the same things if we don't watch it. We, we Listen. You don't have to have a lot of money to love money. We know that, right? Yeah. You don't have to have a lot of money to love money. Just love the fact that you can get money in a way that puts a question mark and causes drama in your life and a lot of the saints. Please. Well, how's it causing drama? Because you're not doing what God told you. We're not doing what the Lord tells us. And so he says here that Aaron made it for reward and perish in the gain saying of court. Court simply said you take too much upon yourselves. You and Moses, Aaron, y'all, you know, want to run everything. I said, man, God put us over this. What are you talking about? Why are you bothering Aaron? He hasn't done anything. He's only doing what I tell him. You know? So the Lord said, look, get yourself away from these guys. Separate yourself from them. Don't make an unusual thing out. Do you know that the earth swallowed them all up and then covered itself and they didn't even have to bear? You got it? Opened up. Because the mother said something, if they die naturally, okay. Unusual, poof, unusual death. Ground sucks them up, and the dirt just comes back on top. Self-burial by God. Death and burial. What are you going to do with that? That's why our core's name is mentioned. These that are mentioned are of the big three of evil. One is of the saints rising above the other saint. That's not acceptable. One is looking for money. One is looking for power and glory to be honored above others. 
But I'm not saying that's, that's, that's unclean. It says, clearly, these particular individuals are not rounded and they are not taught in the way of Almighty God. These are spots in your feast, verse 12, of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, cause they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither it, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You know, twice dead as a tree. As a, they die. This die. See, that's what happens to real trees. Lose, and they sit dormant. Then they kick up fruit. The law doesn't like trees like that that are human. He wants to continue to produce fruit. Don't touch the unclean thing. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly. Why are they trying to convince the ungodly? Because he wants to rescue them. So he convicts them ungodly. Hey, change. Come to me. He says, I take no pleasure in death. But if you refuse that, he will let us die. He says, Among them for all their ungodly deeds. Look at how he speaks of them. Which they have ungodly committed. And all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Do you understand? It is disrespect to speak against God and count contrary to what he said. But you know, we are so interested in having friends. Except the friend that's sticking close in a brother, which is Christ. See, we get into that, you know. But, that, but, but that's my grandmother. You can still love her. But you cannot obey. You know... Let me explain something to you. You know, some grandmothers are witches, right? Let me explain what a witch is. One who practices incantations. You know, there are books. You can buy them. They have spells and you open portals to the devil. He said, why don't the saints have the power? Because God says, okay, it was for a time for us. And we never open portals to devils. We, we show things and magnificent wonders until the scriptures are written and now they're complete. He never said he was taking a power from them. That's why he says stay away from there. Don't touch the unclean thing. So Saul runs all the witches out of the land. And then when he doesn't hear from God anymore because God's done with him. He doesn't though confess that he's in error and walking up in the wrong way. Contrary to God. And he goes to the witch. One of the reasons God said I killed him is because he went to the witch. Why? So if your grandmother's practicing incantations. And I said something. What are you going to do? You're going to follow? Show me the book of enchantments, Granny. Are you going to do that? You know? Don't touch the unclean thing. Do you understand the witches and those who practice sorcery is where drugs come from? Look up the word. That's where we get our word pharmaceutical. I'm not talking about drugs that help your body. I'm talking about drugs that destroy your body. Things that should be administered by qualified physicians. You become a qualified physician and start selling it through the internet or whatever. You understand that the witches did that. That's why the Lord brought them out. Their potions are more powerful than just regular liquor. And you have to understand you cannot be a part of such things. If you're caught up in these things, only the saints of God can help you get out of that. So we have to understand. And finally, he says, what are they? Murmurers, complainers. Walking after their own lust, and their mouth speak great swelling words, having men's personal and admiration because of advantage. Why would I have a man's person that would admire him and want to be like? Because he give me an advantage. So I can be like him. I can be powerful like him. When I speak, people will hear. That is not what the Lord desires. But beloved, remember you the word that are spoken before of the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual having not the spirit. So what do they do? They separate themselves from the teachers of God and back away from the righteous. That's what causes the issue. And what you and I want to do is to bring them back to God through the appropriate teaching. That's the hope. But if not, they sins have separated themselves. And some of us can't see. Okay, this teaching is ungodly. This lifestyle is not right. This lifestyle has have question marks. So I shouldn't do that. And then we have no choice but to separate from them. See, you're thinking it's a respect the person. It is not. Their light 
has separated them. What did God say in the book of Isaiah? He says, God, so far up he can't hear. He said, your sins have separated you from me. So therefore, I have to separate myself from you. That's what God is saying. So he says, but beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You have to be a Christian to do that. Keep yourselves on the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion making a difference. You have to understand some people are confused and they've been taught these things. So you go to them, try to help them understand, show them scriptures and pull them away from unclean things. He says, this is one type of person. But also, verse 23, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The metaphor there is this person is on their way out. They're the one who's instigating. They're the one who's teaching. You have to pull them out and say, man, you can't live like that. You've got to repent. You've got to change. And you have to show them what they're doing with more aggression because they're by the fire. They're by the fire. Verse number 24. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you father before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the one only wise God our Savior. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both non and amen. Look at our last thought. St. Corinthians, what the text our brother read. We've explained these scriptures. St. Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. What is the summation? Wherefore, well, come out from among them and be you separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Here's the blessing, and I'll receive it. See, the Lord is not going to let us come with the unclean thing in our hands and be a part of his teaching. There's only one way to be baptized and be saved. Acts 19 validates that. You can't just be dipped in water and say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The teaching must be of God. The message must be of God. The method must be right. It takes all three. And your heart must be right in order for the Lord to save. But you just get wet like many have done. He says clearly and will be a father of you so you don't have the spiritual father God until you come out from the unclean thing. And you shall be my sons and we cannot be a son and daughter of God until this thing is done. Who said it? Said the Lord Almighty. Opportunity is yours. You know the Lord is clear. Paul says he teaches the same thing in all the churches. But Paul was ousted out of the Jerusalem church. He didn't teach in that one. They told him, go, and if they find him, we'll kill you. So he wasn't talking about that church. He wasn't talking about the church of the Rome that drink wine and party to their God. So what church is he talking about? The churches of Christ, those that belong to the Lord Jesus. And we have to understand that, you know, this thing is not heavy, but it starts from within. You have to decide in your heart if you're going to stand fast with the Lord and be baptized into his kingdom. That's the key. And you have to understand and accept if baptism, just simply getting dipped in water, is simply the answer. Well, then explain this to me. Because I'm all ears to understand how in Acts 19, these people are not saved. The most intriguing thing I've ever seen in my life, knowing that John the Baptist's baptism says in Mark 1.5, it removes sins. Why aren't they saved? Acts chapter 19 verse 1 came to pass that while Paul was at car and Paul went back to the upper coast came to Ephesus finding certain disciples they're learners they're learning about God is Paul just jealous because he wants everybody to be under his rule absolutely not verse 2 he said unto them I received the Holy Ghost since you believe and they said unto them we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost and he said unto them unto what then were you baptized they said unto John's baptism why didn't you say okay well look we understand let me do some explaining to you you know uh now let's see what he does. See, this is what we have to do. Let's see what he does. He's going to explain. Then said Paul, John, true to baptize the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after them, and is on Christ Jesus. So what's enough now? Then a, a nice, robust prayer, right? Let's hold hands together. Father God, protect these souls, these 12 persons souls that I've come upon. Amen. But what does he take the next step? Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why be baptized again? Because the teacher did not teach right. He is not authorized to save. And so Paul has to come and complete it. 
And this is the solution. There is no other. This is the solution. If we believe that. Now it makes sense in Acts chapter 2. When Peter and them are talking. They say men and brethren what shall we do? Verse 37. And in verse 38. Peter says repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you. And unto your children all that are fall. Even as many of the Lord our God shall call. And many of the words that he testify. And encourage them saying save yourself. From this untoward that means this is a perverted. A crooked generation. Then they they glad to receive his word. Were baptized the same day. About 3,000 souls were added unto them. What did they continue in? The apostles doctrine. The breaking of bread. And in prayers. And the Lord added to the church daily. Such should be saved. Acts 2 47. One of the things in verse 42 that's so powerful is the fellowship. To walk in the light as Christ in light. What is the light? The information of God given. As Christ walks in it, that's how you and I have to walk in it. And each has to do that to have fellowship one with another. If you believe that, now it makes sense. Jesus said he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be down. Mark 16 and 16. The Lord is so serious about salvation. He has laid it out for us. If we believe that and can comprehend it, the opportunity is yours right now. As Kennedy did, you can be baptized this day. You don't have to wait. Don't take a risk with your soul. It's not a gamble that you can fall into. Recognize that this is your life and you only get one. You only get one. You only get one opportunity to live it. And that is the years that the Lord will allow you to live. And the key is, is make the right decision. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Paul says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Gentile, bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Why is that so necessary? Because in Acts chapter 8, the eunuch sees the water. See his water. What did the enemy to be baptized? Is if you believe in all your heart, you may. And he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, there are many believe that in a dipped in water. But the idea is that Philip is sent by God. Philip has the authority, he says the right message, and he applies the right method. And after baptism, they go, and the eunuch is rejoicing. Have you been told baptism doesn't save? You have been told a false thought. And therefore, whoever baptized you within that realm could not have possibly saved your soul. 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure went to even baptism is also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but is the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ is going on in heaven. Angels, authorities, and powers are being made subject unto him. If you believe that God will rescue you right now, because Jesus said in Revelation 2 10, Oh, the devil should cast some of you into prison. You don't want to be that one without the Lord to help. In tribulation 10 days, Satan is going to shake that sifter like Jesus told. Peter, he would. He's going to keep shaking it. He's not going to get tired. He's going to keep shaking it. Till he finds something, he's going to take it straight to God. Look, Father. He's going to stand in line with the other. As they come, as he did with Job, he said, look, I know this was no good. Look what I found in it. And now we're in trouble with the Lord. See, because Satan's not going to let it be hidden. God already knows. But Satan, listen, must be respected. Listen to what I'm saying. God is a righteous judge. And when you go before any court in the land, we are copycats of the Bible. Every nation tries to copy the Bible. We want to be the best judge that there is. And every judge must respect the prosecutor, whether he likes him or not. He may know he's a snake in the grass. He may know he ripped me off and I can't prove it. But when he approaches the bench, he must allow him to come. God must respect the devil's accusation. And if it's valid against you, you and me are in trouble. God is not unrighteous like us. He would not say, well, I don't think he did. And no, hey, you got the proof. And look at us. What happened? What did he do? He did it to Eve, right? What is this you've done? Did it to Adam, right? What is this you've done? Told the snake. Look, you're going to be on your belly. You're going to be different now. Listen. We have to understand. God will listen to the devil. When he's telling the truth on us, it's over for us. It's over. And that's our end. It don't have to be that way. If you're here, you want to get baptized, identify. When we sit down, stay standing. If you're afraid, hold your hand up. Someone will encourage you. It will take you to be baptized today, not tomorrow, today. And you'll be safe. You can die. No, okay, I did what he said. Anything happens after this. I'm in good shape as long as I remain faithful. But if you're here and you've gotten off track, you may say, well, you know, 
Man, I haven't been able to be faithful. The devil got me in a prison, physical prison. He's locking me down. It's discouraging me. I don't think God loves me anymore. I'm tired of being faithful. It's time to ask for prayer. You've gotten yourself into trouble. You don't see a way out. It's time to ask for prayer. You're just going to get deep in like a child and yawn. He keeps rapping and rapping and rapping. You're going to watch. He's going to hang himself. You have to be careful because the devil is crafty. He'll tell you, let me do this for you. And he'll wrap it around your neck and take you out spiritually. But if you want God to help, you have to realize you have one friend. One friend. That's in the most high. He'll be glad to help both you and me. Whatever you need now, come on. Give me standing and sing. Have his invitation. And tenderly, Jesus.